Okay, I think we will get started. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining our session. My name is Erica Sevitson, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the Director of Health and Biomedical Library Services at the Brown University Library, and I'm the hiring manager for this position. Um, a few housekeeping details before we get started. Uh, the participant names are of only available, or sorry, are only visible to the host, that's us. If you'd like to remain anonymous to the host, you should be able to change your name by clicking on participants at the bottom of the screen, uh, mouse over your name, choose more than rename and rename yourself as you wish. Um, when we get to the Q&A, you can uh, direct your questions through the, through the Q&A feature of Zoom to remain anonymous. It can be awkward to talk to myself, so please let me know if anything I say uh, needs to be clarified. Um, and my colleague Lauren is going to be monitoring the Q&A just in case. And finally, this is the first time we've done an information session for one of our open positions, so please be understanding as we work any kinks out. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so our agenda for today, uh, we're going to do some introductions of the panelists. Uh, we're going to talk about Providence and Rhode Island. Uh, and then we're going to go uh, do a little bit of a deep dive into Brown University, the Albert Medical School and the affiliated hospitals, talk about uh, DEI at Brown and the library, um, and then go into the structure of the university library, uh, health and biomedical library services, talk about this open position, and then talk about what it's being like, uh, what it's like to be new to uh, Brown University Library. Um, and then finally, take some time to answer any questions you might have. So, introductions. Again, I'm Erica Sevitson. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Director of Health and Biomedical Library Services, and I am the hiring manager for this position. Um, and I will hand it over to Kenvi Phillips. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to extend a welcome as well. I'm Kimby Phillips. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the library. Uh, Lauren? Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Fletcher. My pronouns are she, her. I am the Medical Education and Clinical Engagement Librarian um, with the Hubble's team, and I am a search committee member. Uh, Cass, I think you're next. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Cass Wilkinson Saldana. I use they/them pronouns, and as you see here, I am a social science data librarian. I support economics, public policy, uh, and sociology. I am a search committee member, and I'm also new to Brown. So I started in May, and I'll share a bit about that perspective. And finally, uh, Portia. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Portia Dior Williams. Um, it's actually corrected. My first name is Portia Dior. Um, <laughs> sorry about the hyphen. I'm director of library, uh, director of library human resources, talent, and organizational development. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, uh, and I've been with the university for a little over a year now. Thank you, everybody. And Portia, I apologize. I realized I had it wrong in one place and I fixed it there and I forgot about the other place. So, um, okay. So thank you, uh, everybody. Whoopsie. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Providence. Lauren, over to you. So again, I'm Lauren Fletcher. Um, just a caveat, I'm relatively new as well. I've only been in the Rhode Island area uh, for coming up two years this December. Um, so these are all my things that I have discovered and learned about living in Rhode Island um, and in the Providence area in my past two years. Uh, first and foremost is just looking at general size. Um, I wanted to put up a picture of what New England looks like. Um, I moved up from the South and really didn't know much about New England or its structure or how close things were and honestly how small Rhode Island really is. Um, so it's a tiny little state, uh, but we have a pretty decent population. Uh, what's really nice is that um, it's a quick travel to other really large cities like Boston and um, New York. Um, we've discovered that you can buy a $10 ticket uh, for the uh, metro 
and go into Boston on the weekend as many times as you want. Um, it's a great price. And um, so it's nice to have access to larger cities as well, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, Rhode Island itself has a really booming food scene. Uh, we house Johnson and Wales Culinary School um, within Providence. Um, so we have a lot of interesting food going on. Um, and a lot of local staples. So if you've ever heard of coffee milk or um, doughboys, clam cakes, clam strips, those are all really popular as long oh, as well as the other um, different types of food that we have. We also have our own little Italy, which is fantastic. Um, 20 some different uh, Italian restaurants on the same street, which is fantastic. Um, Rhode Island is the ocean state and we've got beaches everywhere. Uh, there's larger beaches and smaller beaches. Um, so you have more neighborhood style ones and then larger ones like Narragansett or Scarborough beach, or you can go down into Newport area. Um, we also have lots of museums and art. Uh, so Rhode Island school of design is just down, uh, the street from our Brown campus. Uh, they have their own museum that we have access to for free. Uh, through uh, being a Brown uh, staff member. Uh, there's a Tennis Hall of Fame, Children's Museums, an Automobile Museum. Um, during the spring and summertime and going into the fall, we have a special art showcase downtown called Waterfire. There's a picture of that on the next slide. Uh, this is a really fun interactive thing to go do. Uh, tons of outdoor activities, if that's something you're interested in as well. Uh, so besides the beaches, uh, there's plenty of water sports and boating, if that's something you're interested in. Um, most towns have really nice bike paths that go between different areas. Uh, down in Newport, there's the Cliff Walk. Uh, we have Roger Williams Park, Roger Williams Zoo. Uh, we have an island just off of Rhode Island called Block Island that has lots of uh, natural trails that you can go through. Um, and then lastly, New England weather. Uh, so we do get weather. Um, as a Southerner, I was highly happy with what my first uh, two winters were like up here. Uh, it was not as bad as my mind had imagined of, you know, giant snow things. Um, it was much more manageable and um, it was pretty comfortable. And the summers are the best around. Um, super comfortable weather. Um, warm, but not too, too hot. And fall and spring are just fantastic as well. Erica, can you forward the slides? All right. Um, whoop. These are just some statistics about housing and um, living in Providence, Rhode Island area. Um, so I did get a question in the chat regarding housing challenges. Um, here's some of the answer. Um, so the median home price is about 400000 plus. Um, and that would say, I would say typically would be for a two to three bedroom, two plus bath, probably. Um, median rent on a two bedroom apartment is about 1600 plus, depending on where you decide um, to live. I will caveat and say that there are plenty of houses under that median home price and there are rent um, bedroom, like apartments available below that medium price as well. It really kind of depends on where you want to live and what you want to have around you. Um, things within the city center tend to be a little bit more expensive, but we have really nice suburbs and surrounding areas right around Providence that can be on the more affordable side. Uh, so we have East Providence, Pawtucket, Cranston, Warwick happens to be where I live um, that are within 10 to 15 minutes, if that, from Providence. Um, there's other living options as well. If you're willing to live a little bit further outside of Providence, there's uh, more rural areas, um, beach towns. So there's a lot of different options in that front. Um, Rhode Island was ranked number three in best healthcare, 86 best places to live, and 47 best places to retire. Um, I will say it's a very low crime rate. For the type of city that it is, it's a big city in a small state, um, so it's a very good crime rate for that. It's diverse, it's welcoming. Um, you can see some of these other stats. Um, the middle picture is that picture of our water fire that we have. Um, so it's a permanent installation downtown that we have on Fridays or Saturday nights. We light up. 
And then the uh, bottom picture is kind of looking at the pedestrian bridge uh, from the jewelry district, which is where the hospitals, kind of the hospitals are in the medical school, um, over to like the main campus side of downtown. Thank you, Lauren. Okay. Um, so Brown University is pretty well known, I think, as an Ivy League institution. So today we're gonna focus on some of the more relevant points for this position. Um, you can see a nice view of the main campus uh, uh, on the slide. So um, what some people might not realize is that Brown is also an R1 university with four professional schools. Uh, the Warren Alpert Med Medical School it just celebrated its 50th anniversary. School of Public Health is now 10 years old as a school of public health with, um, of course, a history before that of, of growing programs. Um, some people uh, may know the name of um, the dean of the School of Public Health, Ashish Jha. Um, who was recently uh, worked for the White House, but is back on campus uh, stirring, up, stirring things up at SPH there. Um, we also have a School of Engineering uh, and a School of Professional Studies. Um, a notable thing about Brown is it, there is a one faculty approach. So the full-time faculty all teach at all levels. There is no um, research protection for, for I mean, there, there's protected time, but, um, but there are no faculty who just do research. Everyone teaches. Uh, they teach undergraduates. They teach graduate students. It's also a very highly interdisciplinary and collaborative uh, environment. So there are centers and institutes that are collaborations between School of Public Health and the medical school. There is a new um, uh, biomedical engineering uh, uh, institute, it's called iBeam. There's an institute for environmental studies that also features public health, medical engineering, physical sciences people. Um, and that ethos really, really, uh, drills down to the library. Um, so it's in, interdisciplinary and collaborative uh, at the university, but we also we bring that to our work here in the library. There are also plans for ambitious research growth. Um, in the past 18 months, the university has developed plans to grow the research enterprise substantially. They are aware that you can't just hire more faculty and expect the uh, the grants to just flow in. So there's a full operational plan focusing on some specific infrastructure investments, including in the library. Uh, the medical school, as I said, just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Uh, there are 600 medical students, um, including some MD PhD students. There are additional uh, MS or SCMs, uh, Masters of Science program, including a medical physics program and a program called Gateways to Medicine, Healthcare, and Research, uh, which gives uh, students gives students in that program um, more of a clinical experience, is particularly if they are interested interested in uh, going to medical school or to another professional uh, healthcare degree, and they have not had a lot of opportunity to build that sort of um, pre-professional resume. Um, down on the right, you can see a picture of the medical school in spring. On the left, um, that's graduation. Um, very exciting time here on campus. The medical school um, also has affiliated hospitals. We have seven teaching hospitals and there are 17 departments within the medical school. Um, that includes the biology departments and this is where that one faculty comes in. The biology uh, department serve the college uh, and the graduate school and the medical school. Uh, we have 700 residents, um, 600 uh, what we call full-time academic medical faculty, and then uh, over 1,700 clinical faculty. So those are the people based in the hospitals and the clinics. Um, the teaching hospitals are in two major healthcare systems plus the Providence VA. Brown does not own any of our hospitals. Uh, so they are all affiliations, but they are independent organizations. The faculty and residents are employed by the healthcare system or their practice groups, but they're given full Brown library privileges. 
There are a small number of librarians employed by the affiliated hospitals, but most of their time and effort is focused on support for resources not in Brown's areas. So for, for nursing, pharmacy, clinical social work, et cetera. So moving on to the library, um, uh, like, the li like the university's one faculty, we are one library, but there are several different locations. Uh, so some of the locations include the Rockefeller Library, where I'm sitting right now, the John Hay Library, which is our special collections library, and the Sciences Library. Librarians in Health and Biomedical Library Services, or Hubbles as, as we shorthand it, um, are primarily based at the Rockefeller Library, Although Lauren, who's on the call, is based at the George S. Champlin Memorial Library, which is a bookless library space uh, located within the medical school. And I'm going to talk about the department structure and the open position in a moment. But right now, I'm going to hand it over to Kendi to talk about some library-wide initiatives and programs. Thanks, Erica. Um, I want to just review very quickly um, some of the diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility work that's happening both in the library and also across the campus. Um, the first bullet point there, the diversity inclusion action plan is something that is incorporated throughout the university. Brown University is deeply committed to creating a more diverse or increasingly diverse and inclusive community for all of its participants, all of its members from the president to part-time faculty part-time faculty and staff, we are invested in making sure that everyone has a sense of belonging. So our diversity inclusion and action plan, which we shorthand BAP, is a report that um, is Put, compile from various sub reports from different departments around the campus. And there are about 15 or 20 different diversity officers around the campus in different departments. And I am one of, of that 15 to 20 for the library. And our DAP report um, includes information about racial justice and accessibility and staff and hiring. And also it is a report that we use to both um, chart our course, measure our progress, and also hold ourselves accountable for those things that we are committed to doing. One of the things that shows up um, that we have been able to do but not quite finished yet is our racial justice project, which is a self-examination project where we poll and, um, and examine um, our staff and faculty and students users and, and uh, staff to see about how we engage with racial justice materials in our collections and in our instruction and in our physical spaces. It also has helped to uncover some ways that we could improve other things, um, other areas outside of racial justice. Um, and that's something that is ongoing and we're trying to move forward. And it's across all of our departments. Um, the next space is, is an image here of our recently installed Racial Justice Resource Center, which is um, new as in this year, put together to have a physical and digital space to examine racial justice materials from the academic scholarly treatments to the creative artistic expressions and everything in between. And it is a space where we have programming exhibits as well as open study and meeting space. Um, all of these things are measured in part by our um, DEI committee, which is an interdepartmental library DEI committee. So we have members in that committee from various departments within the library, which serves as a way to communicate with administration as both to receive information and also to report on some of the things that are needed and some of the things that we're doing in our different departments to kind of open communication. One of the things that came out of communicating with the staff and that DEI committee was our newly instituted uh, affinity groups. We currently have three active affinity groups and we're working to create a many create more as well as expand those that we have. The last thing that I want to point out on this slide and in my talk is that we have a couple of slogans um, that we are using that we are fully committed to um, for our faculty, staff, and patron base. And one of them is the You Belong Here, which is not just pictured around the physical spaces in the library and on our digital materials, but also it is something that we try to embody for everyone who comes, we, who we come across um, and whom we work with. And so I brought that here for you all today. So if you're thinking about joining us in a sense of belonging, that is something we're committed to, you belong here. And I will turn it back over to Erica.
Thank you, Kenzie, that's fantastic. All right, just waiting for my slide to, okay. So uh, let's get into the department and the position. Um, Health and Biomedical Library Services is a department within the university library. So we support the entire, the division of biology and medicine, which includes the medical school, uh, the school of public health and biomedical and health sciences across the university. Although librarians in this unit mostly support graduate and professional students along with faculty, we also work with undergraduates. Our departmental priorities are based not only on the library's strategic plan, but on the strategic plan um, called Building in, on Distinction of the University and the strategic plans and operational priorities for, for Biomed, the Division of Biology and Medicine, which we call Biomed, uh, School of Public Health, um, and the university's operational plans, such as the operational plan for research growth. So this is our department structure. So I um, am in the reddish uh, color in the middle. Um, I report to the deputy university librarian and also to the medical school, uh, down the line to the VP for clinical affairs and, st and strategy C slash COO, but also a dotted line to the senior associate dean for um, medical education. I should also note that our university librarian has a very, uh, he has a very open door policy and I meet with him regularly. So as we are one library, we are able to utilize the library infrastructure. So collections, systems, document delivery, digital technologies, um, those are all under the deputy UL's umbrella and we all work together. The four librarians at the bottom of this uh, page um, all share about 70% of their job responsibilities. So about 30% of their job is the part that starts with for biomedical research support, for public health, um, or for clinical support. The medical education position, which you notice it still has, um, uh, it has a different title, um, that is a relatively new position. So it was created about two years ago. Um, the title is probably going to change in the next year to reflect that common structure of health sciences librarian for probably medical education. So where did this new position come from? So um, going back to that operational plan for investing in research, the medical school is a big piece of that uh, operational plan. And there are several ways in which the clinical faculty are being connected more closely to the university. Lauren's current title is medical education and clinical engagement librarian. Um, but she's really been focused very effectively on growing our relationships and programs within medical education. And of course, we can always use more help with those 700 residents, 1,700 clinical faculty, 600 academic clinical faculty. So in the last budget cycle, the university librarian and I successfully proposed a position that would allow us to far more effectively reach out to the clinical population. And uh, this one that you are finding out about is, is the result of that. So getting into the job description, um, this is obviously from the job description. The pieces that I put into italics are really the key components of the job. So this is not a clinical librarian position. I wanna make that clear. Um, we are not expecting this person to go on rounds. Although if you were invited to, that would be a discussion to have. Um, this is an academic librarian whose role is to proactively build relationships and connections with Brown's residents and um, our clinical faculty. Um, so there was a question about the percentages of the job. Um, so I want to note that this is not a situation where the person in the job is responsible for all of the work with the clinical population. Our structure is purposely built to emphasize shared responsibility and collaboration. So there might be times when the clinical support librarian is completely swamped and someone else on the team teaches a workshop or takes on a review project. So again, that 30% clinical department engagement, that's the part that's pretty unique to the position. Everything else is shared language across the, um, all of the health sciences librarians. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lauren now to talk a bit about how we all work together.
Hello, everybody. If you see an arm coming up, um, I'm not growing another uh, arm out of my body. Um, I am home with my sick kid. Um, so who just woke up from a nap, of course. Um, so just a little bit about um, how we all work together in our team. We do have a weekly meeting with everyone on the um, health and biomedical library services team where we have a rolling agenda that everyone can provide uh, topics for. We can discuss major things that are happening, um, things coming up. Uh, so it's a really collaborative space uh, for us to be able to do that. Uh, we also have a group chat for all of the health sciences librarians that we use every single day, multiple times a day to ask questions from, is there a color printer? And where's the color printer to help with a search question or um, if someone can take a particular question or help a particular patron. Uh, we also have independent chats that we can send to each other as well. Um, we are taking an approach to where all of our um, health sciences librarians take the lead on, a, on an area of librarianship whether that be systematic reviews or just reviews in general, collection development, um, instruction, to where uh, we all get experience in those fields and in those areas to build ourselves up professionally and um, to help manage the things going on within our team and be as productive as possible um, for our patrons and within the university library. Um, all of our areas of focus, and that's what we kind of call them for um, our health science librarians, whether it's for medical education or for clinical support or public health, uh, is really just a focus. And that person just leads the effort in those areas, but is not, as Erica said, the sole person uh, in charge of that section or that area. Uh, we all take questions, take reviews. Um, from anyone within any department um, as it works out. Um, and if you have any further questions regarding how we work together or the types of things we do, please uh, put your questions into the Q&A because um, that would be a good place to be able to answer many of those. Okay. Now we're gonna spend a minute talking about onboarding. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so this is what the first few weeks in the position might look like. Um, the initial period will really get, will really focus on getting the new librarian comfortable with the structure of the library, getting to know your new colleagues and huddles and learning about our process and, processes and procedures. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the goal is to get you comfortable with the internal functions um, before turning you loose on, uh, on the patron population. Um, I did also want to mention the professional program. So we have had a pro promotional structure within the library, uh, but the program is really outdated. So it's been on hold for a few years while we revise it. So the deputy university librarian is currently working with university H on HR on how to implement the new program. Um, and hopefully we'll have more public details in the next few months. Um, but I can say that the new program is very much about fostering professional development and is definitely more focused on carrots than on sticks. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Cass. Uh, Cass is one of our newest librarians and we'll talk a little bit about their experience being new at Brown. Great. Thank you, Erica. And hi, everyone. Um, I apologize in advance for the bustle around me. I am, um, it's actually part of what I'm going to discuss. I'm taking advantage of the hybrid options as a librarian here. Uh, and so I'm, a, as I mentioned, a social science data librarian. Um, I'm kind of part of the broader community of people with the title librarians that that um, take reference questions, that collaborate on work. Um, I might, I'm on the search committee, I also might be someone that you would refer to if someone's interested in social science data questions. Um, but just to give you a sense, um, I have really appreciated the, I guess just the flexibility, the creativity, 
um, just the the intellectual fascination of, of the work here so far. This morning I met at the RISD Museum's cafe. They have a great little cafe around here because this is my remote day, but I met with my colleague Leo Lovemore and they're a really talented um, librarian um, who has been working on pedagogical approaches to libguides. Had a great conversation about that. Um, you know, this is really common that I will be looped in and help, you know, plan and be part of a variety of different projects. Um, I was just thinking that that so far it's ranged from Coming Out Day, which is a collaborative between the, the Hay Archives, the LGBTQ Center, and some of us um, librarians. Um, I've been part of different outreach um, events of, of, of various kinds of workshop planning. Actually, Andrew Creamer, who you saw a um, picture of earlier, um, we were just chatting about um, purchasing a set of really friendly uh, and, you know, really usable zines for learning key computer science concepts because I will be teaching a GitHub um, class workshop in the fall. So I just want to give you some of those those tangible details first because it's fun to see just a sense of how it actually looks moment to moment. But just to give you a sense that there's a lot of space in this position to kind of figure out, or, or I should say space in the library in general to, to build these different ties and these different concentric rings and different kind of working groups. And I have really, honestly, that makes the work really interesting. Um, I appreciate that there's very much, um, um, someone had asked a question about how we kind of uh, figure out how to answer and track different questions that come up. And one thing that I really love about the way things are set up in, on the reference sense is that there are several different, I guess, like circles of people at various sizes. So I'm on a social science um, group. I'm, on, I'm in a data services group and I'm in the broader kind of reference, what's called Academic Engagement Plus Community. Those are people that have this formal liaison title and take questions. So what's really nice is I feel like I can forward something to that group and they will be able to kind of help me think it through and everyone's been very gracious about, you know, I, you don't have to come in knowing every single thing. You, you bring the thing that things that you specialize in, things that you've had some experience in, there's space to learn, but there is that kind of um, team problem solving element uh, if that captures your interest. Um, and then just, yeah, in general, I, I think, I think maybe the, about being a new person in a place like Brown, there's a lot of great resources. Like I mentioned, we're um, tied even to the RISD library and resources. Um, you know, we're in Providence. Uh, I'm probably a member of six different libraries at the moment in terms of just as a patron. Um, that comes with some complexity. So Brown has a lot of openness with the open curriculum. As a result, sometimes we're doing our, my products have been a mix of these higher level data reference questions, but also sometimes just really figuring out how do we get our name out there? How do we do outreach? Um, how do we build these ties with different departments? I'm less familiar with how that would work in the health sciences and related disciplines, but um, it's it's a nice sense because sometimes I'm in outreach mode, sometimes I'm in problem solving mode, sometimes I'm in teaching mode, and sometimes I'm talking to you from a cafe mode, which is fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, feel free to ask any other um, questions specifically. Um, I'm happy to speak to, again, not part of this committee, but just being new. I started in May, so I'm about three months in. Uh, and yeah, glad you're here and considering this. Thanks so much, Cass. Okay, we just have a couple things left. Um, we're gonna go over the search timeline and structure, and then um, there were a couple of sub pre submitted questions, and then we'll have some time for other questions. So, quick overview of the search timeline. We'll begin reviewing the applications after September 15th. Please remember to include a cover letter when you submit. I know that sometimes it's hard to see how to submit th those in our systems. So um, you can combine the file or if you've already submitted your application, but um, I'm not sure, are not sure whether the cover letter went through, you can reach out to library HR and they can add that to your application materials. Um, my hope is that we will have things wrapped up by the end of October, but things don't always go according to plan, so all of this is subject to change. But uh, we're going to start reviewing the applications after September 15th. We plan to do screening interviews uh, during the week of September 25th. Um, and we plan to do, we're hoping to do full day interviews starting in mid October. Our full day interviews are still fully remote. Um, but they would include meetings with the search committee, the department, and other relevant units and, and people in the library, including um, Portia with the HR, Ken B with Library DEI, uh, Deputy University Librarian, 
Um, there is also a presentation for the full library. Um, it's typically 30 to 45 minutes, including a Q&A. Um, and we haven't chosen the top, the, the presentation topic yet, so um, I can't give a preview of that. Um, and then the finalist period, we are debating whether to include some sort of demonstration of your searching theory slash searching skills. Um, but somewhere after the Zoom interview, but probably like before the full day interview so that we can incorporate and, and talk about that in the finals presentation or finalist portion of the, the interviews. Okay, uh, questions, there we are. All right, so there were a couple of pre-submitted questions. One was, um, is this position uh, remote eligible? Um, it is not remote eligible. It's a hybrid eligible position. Um, and most of our librarians have two to three remote days that are also expected to work on, on site. Um, the, the university is very, uh, does have, have a really good hybrid work policy. Um, and you can easily find that online. And I think I, I pointed to it in the job posting also. Um, there is a question about what a day in the life of the librarian would look like, um, and I think that varies, and since it's a new position, we're not totally sure, but um, I think some days might be like you might fully uh, be able to devote yourself to working on a literature review. Um, others might have a meeting, mix of meetings, consultations, or workshops. Um, I don't think this position would work as much with undergraduates as, say, the public health librarian might or the biomedical uh, research support librarian would. Um, it's possible that there would be some undergraduates, partic particularly those who are in our um, medical, um, continu uh, there's an eight-year uh, undergraduate medical continuum, um, but that would be um, a lesser focus. Uh, there was a question about how, what would be considered appropriate experience in education beyond the explicit uh, requirements. And I think there are a number of ways someone could address this. Um, I, I don't want to try to uh, list them all uh, because um, I don't want people to think that everything I say is the limit. Um, but here's some, some examples are like if you're a recent MLS graduate, but you had a really strong internship with a health sciences library. Um, that could be that could be something that you could spell out. Or if you have a different advanced degree in a health sciences field, but you've worked in academic libraries um, or you've done uh, the some of the work that we talk about in in the job posting, those might be some some ways that you could um, you could spell that out. But again, that is not by any means a complete list of how people might address that question. So uh, if there are any additional questions, um, please use that Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, let's see. Uh, we do have one um, that I said we would answer more fully towards the end. Um, and that is how are research questions tracked and distributed during high volume situations? Um, and if you want, Erica, I can answer that one. Please, go uh, ahead. As someone who answers those reference questions. Um, hold on one second. Uh, so we have a couple different ways we do this. Uh, primarily, we use uh, the SpringShare Lib Answers uh, to track major incoming uh, reference questions, anything that comes in. We have a um, special email address that we direct patrons to that comes to a specific queue within our Lib Answers uh, for the health and biomedical library team. Um, and those are kind of answered on a first come first serve ad hoc basis. Um, if it's a data related question, typically um, Andrew Creamer, our open science librarian is the one to go towards that, uh, answer that. Um, if it's related to one of our areas of leadership, so instruction or reviews or collection development, um, the person who's leading that might take that question. Um, uh, but it really is kind of, if you can answer it, then you take it. Um, we also get questions sent to us individually via our personal emails. Uh, those tend to come more from our focus areas uh, because they tend to have our uh, personal emails as well as our group email. 
Uh, so those are kind of answered again, as you can, if someone messages me regarding a question that might deal with the school of population or the school of public health, I also link in um, Laura Haygood, our um, health sciences librarian for public health um, to see if maybe they, uh, they would like to answer it or we could answer it together. Uh, so it's really a collaborative kind of situation. Um, as far as reviews, we have a form that uh, we ask patrons to fill out if they need assistance with any type of literature um, review, whether that be a traditional narrative or some type of evidence synthesis project. Um, and we take those as um, we have the availability. So we try and keep a running track of who on the team um, has the abil availability to take on an additional review, who might not, um, and we let patrons know whether there might be a delay in um, being able to meet with someone immediately. Um, and then whoever has the next open availability tends to take that next one on. Um, and hopefully that answered the question uh, pretty well. Um, there is one other way kind of um, answered most of it, um, but I just wanted to make sure um, uh, Portia had an opportunity um, and Erica to see it and um, provide any additional answers. And that's what is the hybrid work policy for the librarians? Is there a minimum number of days that are required to be on site? Um, yeah. So I, I guess I can go. So that's a little bit Thanks, too cold. Uh, so while it has you know, HR components to say like, hey, these are some guidelines. I, I do tell people like, although we do have this hybrid um, and this flexible workplace, it's also dependent upon business needs and that's first. So the university as a whole has rolled out uh, new standards of hybrid work and we can, you know, people can essentially work for day, four days a week remotely, um, but, there are certain instances where that may not be able to happen as far as, you know, making sure work gets done. So it's honestly dependent upon the department, the unit. Um, so it could be, hey, you know, there's two days a week where your team may come in and work as a whole. So, you know, you'll probably only be able to take advantage of, you know, uh, three days working remote or something like that. It might not be the full capacity. But again, the the flexibility is for the position first and then for the individual secondly. So I hope that answers um, the question better. And Erica can share, you know, how she yeah. has her team laid out and, you know, the flexibility that the team is allowed to have specifically. Yeah. And in fact, everybody is uh, uh, just submitting new um, alternative work arrangement uh, documentation right now. So most people, I think, are working on site two days and remote three days, um, somewhere in there. Um, there's actually the opportunity to do a half day um, occasionally if, if you'd like to. Um, we do have one day a week, uh, Thursdays, that we all try to be on campus um, because um, we're getting back to at least one in-person meeting a week because um, it really, I think, brings, it, it does seem to bring people together better and it um, we have smoother, I think, relationships uh, when when we at least have that uh, one day a week that we're working together. And that, that also that one, you know, being on site um, allows uh, you to create relationships with um, librarians like Cass, who are maybe in a uh, an adjoining subject area, but not, you know, not part of the team. Or Cass mentioned uh, Leo Lovemore, who's uh, our librarian for history, society, and culture. But Leo also has a really strong um, history of medicine background, and so um, has turned out to be a fantastic collaborator for our group. Uh, so, again, um, so that you know, being being in person does allow for creating those relationships, um, and I think that's uh, that. And, and like I said, there is um, in the when I sent out information. Um, I highlighted the hybrid work uh, work uh, information, so the university's policy is there also. Um, there was a question. I don't know if it's a, uh, open to everybody, so I'm just going to read it out loud. Um, the question is, is Providence walkable or do you need a car? 
Um, I think it depends on you, um, but we do have plenty of people on staff in the library who do not own a car and live near campus um, uh, or, you know, live a couple of miles away, but take the bus or bike in. Um, and there is um, bike and scooter share. Uh, yes, you're, as Cass pointed out, um, your brown ID is actually functions as a bus pass. So you get unlimited uh, public transit. Um, and, um, and I will also say I live um, about, I, I live in a, in one of the suburbs and if I drive, I can drive in about 15 minutes um, door to door. If I take the bus, it's like 35 minutes usually. Um, so really not that bad if, if you're uh, more of a bus person than a bike person. Um, and it is a, a car, you know, fairly car heavy place, but um, there are lots of ways to function without a car. Um, the size of Providence is very small. I worked at University of Wisconsin before I, before I was at Brown. Um, and it used to take me half an hour to work across campus, to walk across campus. And I could walk from the main library here at Brown to our affiliated hospitals in 15 minutes or in half an hour, rather, and go through a couple of different neighborhoods in that time um, and pass a lot of really good restaurants, too. Uh, so it, it is very uh, it, it's a very manageable size. Um, and yes. So affiliated hospitals, um, just going back to that quickly. Um, so the MDs and the residents uh, are covered by the library. Um, MDs and residents are considered, the, the residents are actually, from the point of view of the, the library, the residents are considered faculty. They have full faculty privileges. Um, but the, 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 if you have a Brown ID, you are, you are fully, um, have full access to all library resources is the short answer to that. We do not serve the nurses and pharmacists um, unless somebody has given them a Brown faculty appointment. Um, and our newest uh, librarian, Laura Haygood says, um, as a new hire moving from Dallas, the ability to ride a bus to, a bus to work is thrilling. Um, so Laura's, Laura's new place is about a 10 minute bus ride from campus. Um, and, but she points out that she's also moving from a place with no public transit. So she's excited to have any. Um, parking is available on campus. Um, I can't give you actually the cost per month because it depends on, um, I, it's tiered based on your salary and it also depends on where you want to park. So. I have a, a street spot, which I think cost me 50 bucks a month, um, but a lot might cost more. So, um, but I, I think it's also, Erica, oh, I Lauren, go that some. Um, yes. I actually have a, um, I've had two different parking spots on campus. My first one um, was an open lot um, and it's very, it's very affordable. Like Erica said, it's based upon your pay scale. Um, and then, um, and that was, it was a little bit further away, but also solely because I wanted, I needed to have my car available. Um, and so I took the first option that was possible, but very quickly after that, I was able to get a parking spot in the um, parking deck that's ne right next to the medical school, which is where my primary office is. And it's a little bit more a month, but nothing um, that's, I would find outrageous. Um, it's cheaper than where I was before, which was in a uh, university of Mississippi um, for parking um, for the same kind of level of um, closeness and in a safe structure. And I will say our parking lots are um, monitored by um, parking kind of, I say, police enforcement, um, not necessarily to give you tickets, Security. but just to ensure safety. Um, the parking decks all have um, video cameras, so it is a safe um, environment if you are in a parking deck um, late at night or in, on um, in one of the parking lots. And the other thing, because the, the way the campus is structured, there's the 
there's the the traditional the, the College Hill campus, um, which is the oldest part of campus, um, which is where almost all of the undergraduate instruction is. Um, and then there, the medical school is in a part of the city called the Jewelry District, um, which is Brown is investing more in. So there's going to be a new life sciences building there in a few years. Um, there's a couple of lab buildings. There's a school of professional studies. Um, and then, so that's, you know, a 10 to 15 minute walk across, away from main campus. Um, and then on the other side, uh, about half a mile from the medical school are the majority of our affiliated hospitals, not all of them. There is a, a campus shuttle that connects all of these. So um, you can take the shuttle um, uh, from the, the, the campus, from, from the Rockefeller Library where I'm sitting to the medical school, you can take it out to the hospital, so it really um, aids in uh, in in that um, getting around, um, especially on days when it is pouring down rain, which um, we've had a lot of this year. So. All right, it is two fifty one. Um, I want to thank everybody for sticking with us for uh, fifty minutes um, uh, and for asking your questions. I think. All of the open questions have been uh, have been answered. Um, we, as I said, uh, we will be putting this, making this available on YouTube, um, possibly by the end of this week, more likely by middle of next week. Um, so you will be able to refer back to it. Um, and um, oh, one quick question: Someone asked, um, since the all-day interview is remote, will there be a chance to visit campus if uh, before making a commitment? If you are offered the position, um, that's usually a negotiation point. Um, but yes, usually, uh, uh, often we have people um, visit campus before making uh, before making the commitment or somewhere in there. So um, that's a little bit of a case by case. Um, um, partially because just depending on on the timeline, but it's it's definitely something that has happened before um, for lots of people, um, including for Lauren. Um, okay, so if you have any follow up questions, you please feel free to reach out to myself or to Portia, um, and um, uh, both of our email addresses are here on the slides um, and are also easily uh, findable on the, the university website. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of the afternoon and thank you for your questions and attention and, uh, uh, and hope to see your application materials. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>